mama told me when I was young. Come sit beside me, yeah, my only son. Well, listen closely. Welcome to another episode of Skinner Shorts. Uh, tonight's kind of an exciting episode because we're going to start to talk about Johnny Van Zant. Probably um, a lot of opinions on Johnny, but I love Johnny. And would love Johnny to get in contact with us and do an interview with us to talk about some of these, some of these things and learn more about him and what he was thinking during these days. But today in particular is a special day because it is actually August the 12th. 50th anniversary. 50th anniversary of pronounced album coming out. And has there ever been a better first record by anybody, anywhere, anytime? I thoroughly enjoyed this album. I had it for a long time. I don't think even Beethoven's first album was better than this. It's pretty good. It, my, it probably was. It's probably a classic too. But this, when I was growing up, it... The whole record meant everything to me. It's just a very full album. It's just full. It's one of those records where every song on it is just a wonderment. And Joe, what what's your memories of <laughs> Pronounced? My first album, and I got to know Pronounced very well. I would listen to Side One every night. I'm laying in bed and I've got it stacked on my, on my album player. And I love to hear I Ain't The One. I love the intro to I Ain't The One so much. The guitar riffs on the very beginning of that song just really lit me up. Yeah, I, I, is, that, is that your favorite song? That's my favorite song on this, on this album. I mean, just because I, repetitively, I just heard it so much and I just loved every, every chord on it. Yeah, and I can't tell you, it's hard to pick a favorite, but the thing that really got to me more than anything was things going on. Because I tried to delve a little bit into the political atmosphere of what it was about. But more than anything, I heard Billy Powell. And I thought, wow, that is great. So, happy anniversary, Leonard Skinner. Leonard Skinner smokes. Um, Joe, you mentioned something to me that I never knew. Tell us. Tell them. Well, I think I heard this on a podcast. Oh, okay. If you look at the order of the songs, the first one, I Ain't the One, one. Two stays gone, two. Give me three steps, three. So they're listed like that, I guess on purpose, I'm not sure. No idea, I never even know that. Although I do, there's a lot of podcasters and videos and stuff. We watch all of them. I uh, just learn a lot and of course it makes a lot more questions for me. But tonight, we're gonna start to talk about Johnny Van Zandt. Uh, Johnny Van Zandt, and I were born in the same hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> uh, he's a year older than me. Um, I met Johnny Van Zandt. We were talking about this earlier when they came. The Johnny Van Zandt band came to Memphis. They played at Poets Music Hall. I even found the ticket stub, right? You had it for a long time. But it just says uh, it was $5 <laughs> and no one under 19 admitted. Um, so I don't know. If, I think it was like in February. I don't know if it was 1979 or 1980 now. I'm a little... Brooks Stabs went with me, my childhood best friend. So, if Brooks, if you listen to this and you know what year it was, let me know because I sure don't know. Um, so, Johnny, give us a call. We'd love to get, have you on because it would be a lot of fun. Um, so, that was the first time that I saw Johnny Van Zandt. I don't even know if I knew there was. Uh, I knew there was Donnie because I was a 38 Special fan from the get-go as well. Uh, but when Johnny came up, it kind of shocked me. We heard the Johnny Van Zandt man was coming to Memphis, and we saw him. And they played every song on this record, that show. That was all the material they had. And they weren't going to do an encore. But at the end, Johnny said something like, We don't do this, or I've never done this before. I think that's what he said. Now, of course, he may have done it every night. But I think he said, we've never done this before. And for the encore, they played, I Ain't the One. And I swear, when he was singing it, I could hear echoes of Ronnie Van Zandt. It was just spine tingling, absolutely unbelievable hearing the Johnny Van Zandt band play that. Um, it, was, it was fantastic. And so we'll start off tonight talking a little bit about 
No More Dirty Deals. Love it, love it. Which, it's one of those albums as well that was pretty listenable all the way through. I mean, there might have been some peaks and whatnot, but I I can't think of a song on here that I still don't, you know, still listen to on some of my mixtapes and whatnot. Just, it's a wonderful album. An Al Cooper produced album. So there's some definitely some shades of history, you know, to this record. Yeah, so they're on a different record label. They're on Polydor. Um, was not, you know, Al Cooper label or anything, but they, for some reason, decided to hook Al up with Johnny, and they did a great job. Very, very happy with that record. Um, so the second record was Round Two. And Round Two starts off being different. Everything about it, in my mind, was different. Um, from the cover, which is done by the same folks that did all the Journey album covers. And when you look at the back, you see that um, it's produced and engineered by Kevin Elson, recorded in Doraville, which is great, but you start looking through the songs and who the uh, credits are, you start seeing names like uh, Jonathan Kane. Um, you see Neil Sean's cousin. You see Steve Perry doing backing vocals. I mean, it was a lot more polished for me, um, but what it didn't hide was the greatness, in my mind, of Johnny Van Zandt's voice. I think they were trying to publicize this album a little bit more, put a little bit more money into it, a little bit more notoriety into it, and they're always trying to, to figure out the sales side of it. Yeah, so they get rid of Al Cooper, they bring in Kevin Elson, um, who's definitely you know, he's a, a 38 special, a lot of different things, but they, but they do, they, they make it a little, I'm not sure what the word is, but it's a little commercial. A little right? commercial. We say popish commercial. We can always go a little bit commercial. Yeah. But again, the strength of Johnny's voice, every song. And in my mind, this is controversial, of the three Van Zandt brothers, I thought Johnny has the purest voice. He's just got... He's not Steve Perry or nothing, but he just got a very pure, uh, you know, lead vocalist type sound, and I love that about we him. We noticed that on the first album. We knew that he he could sing. He's got a great voice. Yeah. You know, no more dirty deals. How many times do we listen to that over and over and over? It's just great sound. Yeah. I mean, everything on that record, and and I, of course, you know, one thing that you notice when you go through there is Donnie co-wrote a bunch of these songs along with Johnny and different members of the band. So I think that, that Johnny was fortunate to have his brother available to kind of, because Donnie obviously, some of the, I know that 30 Special turned into be the Don Barnes band, but even then, I loved a lot of the Donnie Van Zandt songs. I mean, the 20th Century Fox and those kind of things. Great stuff. Well, we can have an episode where we talk about that later, but clear to me, Donnie was pretty good with, with lyrics and stuff, so I appreciate that. Um, now, I mentioned Johnny's vocal, you know, pure purity. Don't get me wrong. No one had the power of Ronnie Van Zandt vocally. Nobody. I mean, not Greg Allman, not Bruce Springsteen, not Rod Stewart, not anybody had the vocal power in my mind because he could just, he had that something extra, that something special Ronnie had, you know, that no one could ever duplicate. It's just that normal feel. He had a feeling. He just had a feeling from Ronnie when he's singing. He gave you that feeling. He expressed it to you. Yeah. And I had that feeling when Johnny Van Zandt band covered I Ain't the One that night at Poets Music Hall in Memphis, Tennessee. It was spine tingling. Um, continue to talk a little bit about Johnny Van Zandt. Paid a little more for this record. As you can see, I paid eight forty nine for it. A twenty nine, I got a discount, um, which is a lot. Of course, it's a brand new record at the time. What's interesting about this record is, you see the cover, you see the back, you really don't see any of the journey kind of stuff happening here. And you look back, who produced it? Here's Al Cooper back again, all right? And I don't know. I, I, we could talk about individual songs and this, and maybe we'll get to it in Johnny Van Zandt Part Two. But you know, "It's You" was on MTV. It's a great song. Just a great song. I mean, wow! This is just something so dynamite and so dynamic that I thought 
futures unlimited, right? And again, a lot of lyrical help from his brother. Pretty interesting. So after that came out, I was excited for the Johnny Van Zandt future. Now, at this point, there was the Rosin and Collins band was out there, and he thought that was the direction those guys were going. And the next thing we hear from Johnny Van Zandt is Brickyard Road. What do you think about Brickyard Road? Oh, I mean, it's a total classic. It's a spine tingler. It's a, it's a goosebump material. Your hair is standing up on the end. It's one of the greatest tribute songs I've ever heard. Uh, and it's a family song. I mean, it's just family. Brickyard Road. I just cannot ever... I, and it was on a record that, to me, was unlistenable after Brickyard Road. And maybe it's, it was a fine album, a fine record or whatever, but Brickyard Road just blew everything else out of the way. You, you had no interest in hearing anything but that. It was, for us, it was personal. I'm sure it was personal for them as well. It was emotional. But it, it was absolutely... Yeah, I was unbelievable. As much for us, you know it was for them. I mean, we're we're go, we're getting we're getting goosebumps and tears, and you know how could they even go through singing it? Yeah, I I don't know <laughs> the answer to that either. I it must have been very very difficult. So then we had this one. So, Rosin and Collins is gone. Alan Collins is laid up. This comes out, and this is what we had to look forward to. Another nice record. Um, I can't think of anything really bad about it. It was a Rodney Mills record, which Rodney Mills had worked with 38 Special. I think he did some stuff with Atlanta Rhythm Section, maybe. It's a Doraville record. He'd right? been around. Rodney Mills had been in Doraville Studios quite a bit. Yeah, he may own it for all I know. Hmm. But, you know, it didn't receive the airplay. I don't know that it was ever played on Memphis Radio, which, you know, Memphis Radio was a Skinner kind of place. I mean, you know, it didn't didn't hit at all. They switched record labels. Uh, this is on Geffen Records. So, I, we'll talk about individually about it later, but commercially it was a flop. I mean, even though, you know, we're Johnny Van Zandt fans and what, whatever. But the next thing we find out, we start hearing rumors of the tribute tour. They're getting the band back together, right? All, like the Blues Brothers did. And the name we're wishing for, because there, there was no certainty who the new lead singer would be. There was no certainty. I mean, there was a Donnie Van Zant rumor. There was a Johnny Van Zant rumor. There was a David Lee Roth rumor, probably. <laughs> that would have been interesting, to say the least. Um, you know. Never. Yeah. And I don't think Leslie West was going to be on that thing, you know. No, but, never. <laughs> but there were a lot of rumors swirling around, right? Um, and when it was announced, it was Johnny Van Zant. To me... It was bittersweet because I viewed Johnny Van Zandt as something more. To me, there didn't have to be a Leonard Skinner for me to appreciate Johnny Van Zandt and his voice and his songs and his music. Even his band, I thought his band was just top notch, right? Um, it, was, it was bittersweet because I think we all knew at that point that once they got started and they saw how they packed the Mid-South Coliseum, you know, 1987, and everywhere they went, I'm sure, it it wasn't gonna be a one-time gig for Johnny. It was gonna be a new lifestyle, and I, I I think we missed out on something special there. Possibly. I just when we were there, I just didn't get the feeling that it was a Johnny Van Zandt that I loved. I felt like he was pressing. I felt like he was trying to be his brother. Maybe too much singing songs like his brother. That was a mistake to me. Personally, because I love Johnny Van Zandt's voice, natural voice, not trying to put it in somebody else's spot. Yeah, in later years with the reformed Leonard Skinner tribute band or whatever you want to call him, he did start coming back to some of his vocal characteristics and whatnot. Um, but it was it was too late by then. You know, I think they'd missed the window that Johnny could have had. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff. It'd be really cool to talk to Johnny about himself. Uh, hopefully, um, he'll get the message. I'm going to try. He can come talk to us. Um, now, I think Johnny was in the middle of, of um, working his, his new his record deal for another couple of albums, maybe, when, the, when they started talking to him about 
doing the tribute tour. So, and we may have missed out on some new Johnny Van Zandt stuff. You know, other than we're just getting rehashed, you know, Johnny Van Zandt. Forced. He was forced. I just thought he was forced a little bit. Not being the singer that he is. Yeah, and I think that probably there was some family stuff and some pressure from the, the, the Leonard Skinner fans. And I, I don't know exactly. I'm sure he was eager to do it once he got involved. But um, because they were commercially successful. They made a lot of money. Um, but the Johnny Van Zant opportunity was, was gone for us. So anyway, anything else we want to talk about before we end tonight and we get ready for the next Johnny Van Zant part two? Yeah, we'll be a little bit more prepared. Happy anniversary pronounced. We love you. We'll always love you. Yeah, it, um, absolutely momentous record and one that, um, you know, I've got the lyrics to Simple Man on my wall right here in the hallway. So, anyway, until next time, we'll see you then.